Hello, we're back again. Welcome to the next product spotlight. And as I mentioned last week, Jason's back. Thanks again. Yep. Again, again. I'm, I'm getting my frequent flyer miles. Right. <laughs> frequent driver miles all the way from yeah. Timbuktu. Well, you know, owls do fly mostly at night. Which oh, okay. Is, that's how it works. Oh, I guess so. And you showed up in the morning, so. That's how it works. Yeah. So, as promised last week, Jason's back. He's going to show us how to build and weather the lumber loads that Owl Mountain Models came out with in September this year into something that looks like a real load, like what you saw last week. It's most one so. of the most requested things, actually. Is, is it? Is, yeah, when I go to shows and things, people are asking always cool. how, to, how to do that kind of stuff. Well, and you're going to get it right here. So, let's go over to the workbench and get started. Sounds good. I'll grab my kit. We're going to be looking today at one of our 3004 lumber load kits, which is here. And these are the contents of the kit with four sprues of lumber and then the additional uh, layer of um, the additional sticker of dunnage. And so we're going to be building this kit. As we're building the kit, we're going to make the plastic parts look like wood and we're going to be talking about how to paint them. And then we're also going to be showing how to install them on one of our F50 series flat cars. Okay, so here's all the tools and our paints that we're going to be using this time. We're going to be using a selection of apple barrel paints. And we have a spray paint from Tamiya. You can use wooden deck tan or light sand, are both generally good colors to use as a base. And then we'll be using uh, various dry brushing and wet brushing techniques for the apple barrel paints. The brush that I have in the shot right now is a cheap brush from Michaels. You can even see the glitter in it. It's basically, I think you can get five for three dollars or something like that. Some of the techniques we're going to be doing will chew up the brush bristles. Um, so we don't really want to have a very expensive brush for what we're doing because we're going to be abusing it somewhat. And over here we have our Tamiya glue, which we'll be using to weld the kit together. Here's our sprue cutters that we're going to be using. These are flush cutting with a ground flat back so that the sprues will be cut cleanly. This is probably the most expensive thing out of all the tools that are laid out here in front. And this is one thing that you probably don't want to skimp on. These are probably $10, $15 cutters. And lastly, we have our mill file here. This is from basically a hardware store. These can be had just about anywhere in the country pretty easily. This is actually a little coarser than I probably need, um, but we're just going to be using it to clean up the edges of the lumber load stacks and uh, getting rid of the last rem remnants of the sprue bits. So we're ready to start our assembly now. We've already pre-painted these parts with the Tamiya Wooden Deck Tan. There's two ways to do it. One way is you desprue all the parts, clean them up, and then paint them all. The other way is to pre-paint the parts like we've done here and then desprue them, but then you're going to have to do touch-up work along the edges where you do the cutting and the filing. So I've decided to do it this way. And so basically we're going to just come in here and use the sprue cutters. And I'm lining these up so that I can feel where the cutter is. And ideally that this is leaving minimal material on the gates left for cleanup of the file. And I'm, in this case, going to leave the pieces inside the sprues. We'll, we'll be cutting those out shortly. Okay, so we're going to now cut out the bracing and stakes from the middle of these three or four sprues. These are basically extra parts that are included in the kit for certain versions of the load and special applications. Some of these we'll be using, some of them we will not be using. And the easiest way to cut these I've found is basically just come in and it's possible to grab them all at once or a pair at a time. So now that we've gotten rid of the uh, interior pieces, I've set them each aside in a little uh, container, each in their own, so that we can find which one's which later easier. Um, so now I'm going to set these aside and we're going to file these little bits of uh, sprue that are left. So we're going to file these and be advised that these 
lumber loads are a little bit fragile, so I'm holding very carefully as close to the sprue location as I can. And that should result in a nice, clean, filed piece. There's still a little bit of material there. Mostly that will just knock out of the way with a fingernail or a number 11 or something if you sweep it by there. But that should clean it up pretty quickly. Basically, this shouldn't take more than a few minutes to do. It helps to go at a slight angle to match the draft angle of the, the mold. But it shouldn't take very long to get the rest of these filed up. We're going to use apple barrel colors here. And sometimes people ask, you know, what colors you're going to be using. And I might be starting with these colors, but this whole thing with the lumber loads is going to be a game of, it's like Bob Ross, you know, of how, how much color and shading are you going to do and which hues are you going to use and this kind of thing. So there's going to be a lot of changing back and forth with things like khaki, the new color Golden Sunset. I'm used to using the apricot, which is a really bright uh, orange. Um, one of our customers came back a few years ago with our earlier lumber kit and said, um, you know what color really works well? Daylight orange. And you're sitting there going, daylight orange? That is insanely bright. And But actually it turns out the daylight orange, if you don't do multiple coats, you sit there and you go, well, that's really stark. But wood actually does have quite a bit of orange in it. And so if we streak it slightly, um, it will tend to look like wood eventually. That's even the golden sunset here is pretty bright, but we'll be able to tone that down here pretty quickly. Um, so I'm gonna grab some khaki. So getting back to which colors exactly you're gonna end up with when you're done, I don't know. It's some mix of all of these colors and whatever they magic they do when they're together. Uh, that's what we're gonna do to make the wood. Um, my my favorite thing to say about when you're doing wood weathering like this is do this until you decide that it looks like wood to you because that's at the end of the day what's important that it's very Bob Ross kind of when it looks like wood to you you are there often people will think that what I'm doing right now is dry brushing quote unquote it's not really dry brushing I actually would consider coining the term more like wet brushing because I mean that's a lot of paint you know, I'm not wiping this off. I'm not getting rid of the paint. I'm using all of that paint. Uh, that All of that paint's gonna go onto the model. And the other thing I'm using is either alcohol or water. Uh, right here, I'm just using the Tamiya lid for uh, a bowl. You need to kind of judge based on the weather, whether you wanna use alcohol or if you wanna use water. Alcohol has the advantage of not having as much surface tension, so it'll flow down nicer it won't, and um, you, the main thing to do is not leave watermarks with water, and alcohol is better about that. The problem with alcohol is it cooks a little bit too fast, so you really have to keep moving to keep the uh, surfaces wet while you're streaking them and doing various effects and things like that. Right now it looks pretty basic, like I'm just laying down some basic color, but this is pretty much how you have to start. Basically I'm trying not to leave any huge swaths of a given color. I'm just trying to break it up slightly. I could even go in and grab something like the burnt umber here and just grab a tiny bit on the tip of the brush and I could come in and I could streak like that and then as a couple, as I do a couple of streaks that starts blending in to the area around like that and adds a little bit of extra depth. If I go back to one of the older ones here for example I could grab a little bit of a little bit more khaki maybe and go in here like this and add a little bit of this is where I'm saying I'm almost using the the part as the can't the uh, palette working with acrylics I found it's not worth having a palette because all your paints gonna get stuck to the palette and dry out on you okay so just to show what the apricot color looks like when it goes on it looks super orange when it's on your brush and when it's in the bottle but that's actually almost toned down to the same color now as the golden sunset is and with a few other light colors mixed in, it blends in pretty well. So I put them all together. This is all dry fit, so they're still loose to each other. Now what I'm going to do here is basically do the side of the stack. And you could do this with a paintbrush or an airbrush, but I found that this works pretty well. It's a, way, it's a little bit time-saving. Um, 
one thing you don't want to do is make them all look the same. So one thing I might do is grab a little bit of the darker color here and for example do it up here and then maybe just get some of the orange just to stay here like that and then what you can do let's go to the other side and I'm just gonna this um, khaki color actually is pretty close to the same color as the wooden deck tan so I'm not even bothering to touch up those filing points this this color is actually just blending it all in pretty well um, but what we'll do here is grab some other so you can use darker color like that you can use some of these lighter or orange colors now that looks really gaudy can bring it back a little bit with a little bit more of the a little bit more of the khaki color or even a little bit of the darker now this is one place probably where alcohol is not such a good thing because it would actually lift the older layers of weathering but eventually what you should be able to do is flip these when they're in the actual kit or when you stack them and there'll be actually a little bit of difference even if you uh, start flipping them like this it's like a deck of cards almost and they'll have a little bit of different effect and one of the other options that I can do and this is why we have a set of paper towels right here next to me do a wash of the brown and when I do this you're gonna think that what in the world is he doing that's horrible that's way overdoing it and um, if you get all this color on there then you can grab a paper towel and do some streaking effects like this and that gives each board a slightly different look yeah, so one of the other things to do while this is wet is take the stacks apart and do a little bit of streak weathering like this into the stack. Uh, again, like with the watermarks, you don't want to have watermarks staying on the models. Like if this got stuck this way and anybody was able to see into here with, with how the stacks eventually will turn out, you don't want to have anything like this that will eventually ruin the look of the load. Right here I have a couple of the stakes that came out of the lumber load kit or lumber load sprue and I'm actually holding them against each other I found this kind of accidentally a few weeks ago um, it was a really interesting way to make a little wash and then that's a little bit too dark and I was able to get a really cool dark gray color that I was able to play with basically the stakes are not going to be the same wood as the uh, rest of the load because the wood for the stakes is a hardwood and so that wood is not going to be the same stuff that you're generally shipping it's going to be different so going in here and kind of doing a different technique on the wood and getting some different colors is uh, a good thing and sometimes the stake material was outside for longer so in this case I'm going for kind of a grayish wood grayish tan look so we've set the other parts aside for a little while while I'm doing this step. Uh, again, with the alcohol, um, you don't want to do... You get to a happy point and you might want to stop so that, that the parts will dry more thoroughly so the alcohol or the water doesn't change the, the what you're happy with and then you can come back a little bit later and do a little bit more and change it. So it doesn't hurt to go do something else for a little while and then come back to it. A very one of the sets of projects. Now we're going to do a little bit of quick weathering on the uh, stake sprue here and double checking the stakes are on this side so I'm just going to come in and and do these stakes real quick. Um, again using a slightly darker color this is actually melted chocolate. See the problem model routing makes you hungry that's that's one of the problems especially when they name all the paints after foods. I mean, we got. I mean, just here we have melted chocolate and apricot. I mean, what kind of crazy mixes do we have here? I want pizza. One of the last steps, once you kind of get happy with the look of the load, is doing an actual black wash. And um, let's see if I have the wash at the right shade here. Uh, that's not too bad. 
So you can do a thing like that and that will tend to highlight and if you wait just the right amount of time before you come back with the paper towel you can wipe off some of the effect. So that's about right. And you can get it to just be enough to highlight the board edges. About like that. So we've done all the pieces now. They're all weathered. Uh, this is all of the um, sticker material that was inside. And um, we also have the uh, bracing material all weathered up now. These here I've decided are kind of the nicer ones. I'm going to use these as the top uh, of the various stacks. These pieces here are not quite as nice. I don't. I, some of them I didn't even really finish. Um, I would suggest actually weathering all of them and then you choose the ones that you like the best to be the top ones. So I can basically grab random pieces here. Some of these have each end is different. So like this one's random at both ends. This one is more even at this end. Uh, this one here is quite even except for one random board sticking out. And if you don't like one of the boards sticking out for some reason, you can come in with the flush cutters and just snip and it's gone. So now you can change the look of your load. Of course, you'd want to touch up the weathering on the end of that where, where you might have done that. So there are basically six different lumber panels. Four of them are empty, uh, hollow pieces, and there are two pieces that are solid. This one has random at one end and very even at the other end. This one is fairly random and then really random. So you can basically mix and match and make the kit however you want to build a pile of lumber. And so in theory, we sit here and put together a stack of these and then put one of the one of these on top, for example, and there's basically a uh, one of the units, as they're called. What we're going to be doing next is getting the stickers, and these are separators. I believe in the kit these are item D. And these go between the car and the load, and between each layer of the load as they go up. And those are also included in the uh, bracing sprue here, right in this area. So we will clear the deck and start assembling the load next. I've decided that this is kind of a good looking stack of wood, so um, kind of happy with the shading and everything of it. So now we're going to go ahead and put it together. Um, I also am going to grab three of the separator item D's and I'm planning to cut the ends off and touch up the weathering at various steps as the assembly is going on. So this is pretty simple. I'm going to set these aside and just start with this pair. If you're, One little trick is if you're doing a gondola, I found you can actually get the loads stacked in the corner like this. And then as you do the gluing, you can actually just come in here and hit. You need to be a little careful not to glue the, the load to the gondola, but like if I go up slope like this, the glue will wick into the joint and not risk gluing the, the load to the car. And then after that's dried, you can do more. I mean, I could actually sit here and do all four of these at once if I wanted to. That's a clever trick. It's actually holding it in place. Yeah. So and you don't have to use corner... Uh... Corner jigs. Yeah. I actually found this when we were doing one of the pilot models for the uh, 3005 kit. I had about three hours to build the whole kit. So I was doing it and it was also a tight fit on the car, so I didn't want to um, risk having any of the load be um, not square. Mm -hmm. I'm not being too careful about how much glue I'm putting on there either. I'm just kind of running the brush along it and letting it wick into the joints. So that's pretty good. I'm going to press it down here and let it melt everything together. And um, that should be it. And that was all real time. There's still a little bit on the outside, a little bit of glossiness, but that should dry out and become more dull. So that's basically one of those. That's a unit. Now I'm going to grab the uh, stake separators here. 
these are separators you can see the sprue actually narrows right here so these are fairly short so I'm going to cut those ends off I'm going to square these ends up like that and then come in and these parts needed extra gating to be able to be injection molded so that's why there's those extra little bits of plastic in there apologies for all the modelers that are annoyed by such things but it was kind of a required we either do this or we don't have parts okay so the separators there's going to be three per unit and I'm going to glue these in place and I'm just going to glue these in roughly a third of the way it's kind of cool to have them right near the ends where they uh, can attach better with the gluing all the way across that one I'm not going to do that on in this case I'm not cleaning the uh, paint off and sometimes you might want to scrub slightly like that to get the glue to get rid of the paint and get down to decent uh, plastic to make a good joint. I've finished five units now. Um, they're all stacked up. If you wanted to, a sixth unit could be made to fit there like that. But I'm going to do a slight variation this time and do a fifth unit being centered like that. Right now, we're going to be... Uh, trimming down the stickers, these separator pieces. Number one, I've already cut some of these and they're very bright because they're showing the inside of the lumber load, so I need to come back and touch those up with the paintbrush. Basically, these should be even with the inside of the stake pockets. So to do that, we are going to come in and start trimming about 15, 10, 15 thousandths off the edge of the lumber load. And I'm just doing this by feel, but that's about right should be slightly wider than the lumber load itself. So here we have two units and we're going to be putting these together like this and getting our glue coming in and flowing the glue into the joint at the bottom of the separators into the top of the second load or the second unit set. Turn it over and do the same thing on this side. The capillary action should pull the glue down into the joint there. There's one half of the load, ready to go. Each time you build a load, it's going to be a little different. There's going to be some width variation. Uh, with the way the panels stack. So this is an exaggerated example. Sometimes you'll need shims to shim the load narrower. Uh, if it's tighter like this, it'll need shims. If it doesn't need shims, you'll just be able to put the stakes right against the side. So what we're doing right now is gluing the top unit of lumber onto the load. And it's going to be bridging across between the two lower stacks. And I'm holding it on there because it needs to weld the separators to the lower stack of the load. I've been playing around now for a couple of minutes with the stakes. And something like this is what it's going to turn out like. There's going to be various support members going this way and also this way across the top of the car to a set of stakes on the other side. But I think we're pretty close ready to start gluing. So to start gluing... I'm going to grab a stake and bring the car side up to it and get my glue and again start gluing it like this. At some points super glue can be used if the liquid glue is not able to get through the paint or anything like that. It is permissible to use super glue. Okay, so we'll be putting a shim in here with a stake over the top, like this. And we need to do that because this load is slightly narrower by about the width of our shim, which is about 25 thousandths thick. So if I lay the shim up here, I need to cut the top off. Easily done. Sometimes modelers will try to 
put shims the other direction. But unfortunately, in reality, that would only support the board that they'd actually be sticking to. And the goal of this was to contain the entire load and make sure that the whole load didn't shift. So we want the shim actually to be vertical. So there's the stake. And make sure the stake sits all the way down into the bottom of the stake, or to the top of the stake pocket, because we want it to look like it goes into the stake pocket. The next step is going to be putting on the little cross ties onto the stakes. So now that this is positioned, I'm going to come in and put my glue on. And that will flow in and hold the joint. Now these pieces I'm going to be doing a little bit of touch up on as there's a little bit of plastic exposed. and we'll be trimming off the extra with our cutters. Okay, so now we're going to use our flush cutters and come in and trim up the rest of these cross pieces, even with the outside of the stakes. This can be done with a razor blade, but it's not fun to do. It's, it can result in broken boards, so I really do recommend using these flush cutting tools. So now that we've trimmed off all the cross ties, we are going to do the longitudinal ties. These are item E, and you need to make sure you leave about four inches of material hanging out to the ends, to the uh, past the ends of the last stake. In this case, I'm going to actually leave the material long, and we're going to cut the rest of that off and use it as extra. There's six pieces included in the kit. I've only cut three so far to use and we'll cut more if needed. All right, so now we're gonna cut the longitudinal ties and I want about four inches hanging off there, so that'll work. And um... there we go, okay. last piece going on. And after this, it'll all be little bits of touch up and in a few cases, I may use a little bit of thick CA glue to beef up a couple of the joints. Um, also, just a quick note, we have gone in and put glue down the edges of the cross ties to secure it to the actual load. Uh, you need to be a little careful doing that, not to mess up the streak weathering and so forth like that. But that's pretty much it. Okay, so we're redoing a little bit of the alcohol mix here. Again, this could be done with water. Um, sometimes I'm finding that the water does actually make a significantly different effect. So sometimes you may prefer the water. Try my suggestion would be try both and see which method you prefer. Yeah, we're pretty much done now. Um, all of the bright spots around on the ends of the stakes and dunnage and everything are now touched up. Um, I tried to match them again with our colors that we were using earlier. So now that's pretty much done and we'll get a couple of good pictures of it. And there we go. All right. And there you have it. Yep. It looks like wood for real. I mean, this is, I've seen a lot of models and the, the, the techniques that you used on this are very effective. I mean, it's it looks like something that came straight off a prototype track someplace. So, and it's really not that hard. I mean, I was really impressed with how easy, I mean, the, the paints and the brushes and all that stuff, stuff I could do. Yeah, and it's so, not very expensive either. Right? You don't have to have a double action airbrush or something like that to do it. It's, it's very simple. Yeah. And it's fast. Right. And some of the techniques, as um, we've seen, they're... They're fast, and if you take too long, that actually is a problem. So right. you actually have to develop just a kind of a quick brush and sure. do it before things dry. So here's a question, and, and the, the answers to this question are in the product or, or the video description below, but where can people get the kits, and well, what do they need to some, do? Some local hobby shops in the Bay Area and around the country have picked up our product line, which, oh, is, good. which is good. Um, I'd always like to support the local hobby shops because they get customers that 
our, aren't going to come to our website, mm -hmm. quite frankly. And um, then again, there's the uh, website, which is owlmtmodels.com, link below, of course. Oh, MT yeah. for mountain. Yeah, yeah, abbreviated. I mean, why, why sit there and type the whole thing out? Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, you can come to our website. I'm also posting additional information, actually, on the website. Sure. For some of the weathering tips and stuff like that, um, additional prototype information, things like that. Um, but in terms of actually seeing how to do the weathering and so forth, the wood effects, um, the video I think is a much better sure. media. Thing. People just watched it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think it's. I think everybody. It's a lot easier to do that. Cool. After you've seen how to do it. Well, we're looking at the possibility of having Jason come on fairly regularly with other kits and techniques and stuff like that. So. We'll see how long that takes. Yeah, but maybe, we'll yeah, maybe not even Owl Mountain projects, but just sure. general. I have some other tricks and variations on the weathering, right. uh, the, the building the lumber load that I wasn't able to show today because we were building the stock kit, mm -hmm. and there's some variations in how you build the kit that could be done as sure. well and used on other loads too. One of the things that's kind of cool about Owl Mountain models is that Jason's just not a guy who makes models to sell. He's actually a hardcore modeler, in case you couldn't tell. Thirty-five years, right? That's pretty hardcore. And also, I would venture to say, one of the preeminent knowledgeable people about Southern Pacific stuff. So I know when I have a Southern Pacific question, you're one of the first people I think of to ask about it. So, yeah. well, I know. Books help. Books help. You yeah. know, go, go read your books. <laughs> you mean I have to learn how to read? <laughs> yes, it actually is a good thing. And look at photos. There's a lot of photos out there that actually have a lot of information. In I it. do like photos. Yeah. Yeah, picture I books. like picture, picture books. Picture books are good. Yeah. yeah. There's certain books I read for the articles only, but, you know, the pictures in those are pretty good, too. The centerfold of the freight car with the lumber load is... It's great. It's primo. Yeah. yeah. There you go. We'll catch everybody next time. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Take care.